8 TV. Good neighbors you can turn to for news, weather, and sports. This is KAIT 8 News. Good evening, I'm Diane Davis. And I'm Tony Brooks. In a statement given to the police and obtained by a Memphis newspaper, 17-year-old Jesse Miss Kelly allegedly confesses to watching two other suspects choke, rape, and sexually mutilate three West Memphis second graders. Jenna Newton reports. According to the published report, Miss Kelly told police he watched 18-year-old Damian Eccles and 16-year-old Jason Baldwin brutalize the children with a club and a knife. The report says as Ms. Kelly told police, Eccles and Baldwin raped one of the boys and sexually mutilated another as part of a cult ritual. Ms. Kelly is quoted as saying he did not take part in the rape and mutilation, but that he helped subdue one victim who tried to escape. At a press conference, Inspector Gary Gitchell said the case against the accused teens is very strong. Scale of one to ten, how solid do you think the case is? Eleven. <laughs> It appears satanic worship may have played a role in the murders. Since the very beginning of the investigation, people all around West Memphis have come forward with stories of satanic cults. Reverend Tommy Stacy's church is down the street from where the bodies were found. One year ago, Damian Eccles told the church's youth minister he had a pact with the devil and he was going to hell. In the quiet town of West Memphis, Arkansas, in the spring of 1993, on May 5th, a dark and perplexing mystery unfurled that would captivate the nation's attention and forever alter the lives of those involved. It all began innocently enough when three young boys, Stevie Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers, ventured into the wooded realm of Robin Hood Hills one fateful afternoon. Unfortunately, this seemingly ordinary outing would lead to a chilling sequence of events that would soon leave their community in shock and horror. As the sun dipped below the horizon on that ominous day, tragedy would strike the innocent in such ways that one begins to question all reality. What transpired in those twilight hours would defy comprehension and send shockwaves throughout the nation. With the expertise of forensic analysis as our guide, we delve into the enigma that is the West Memphis Three, a haunting tale of abduction, violence, and the relentless pursuit of truth. On Wednesday, May 5th, Weaver Elementary School classes usually ended by 2.30 p.m. However, on this day, Pam Hobbs retrieved her son Stevie earlier than usual. When they arrived home, Stevie, eight years old, began homework while his mother prepared for work. At 3.30 p.m., Michael Moore, Stevie's friend, arrived to convince Stevie into joining him for a bike ride. Stevie excitedly obliged as it provided him an opportunity to enjoy his brand new bike provided by his grandpa Jackie. Stevie's mother allowed him to join Michael, but only with the exception that Stevie returned no later than 4.45 p.m. as her shift at Catfish Island started at 5. The two boys swiftly departed hopped their bikes and rode off, never to be seen in such spirits again. At 4.15 p.m., Terry Hobbs, Pam's husband and Stevie's stepfather, arrived home from work. He briefly visited with his wife and daughter before changing into clean clothes. When he emerged, he was dressed in a purple tank top, athletic shorts and a pair of white sneakers. As 4.30 p.m. approached, reports from neighbors Marlene Hollingsworth and George Taylor would later confirm that Stevie and Michael were seen out riding their bikes. However, by 4.45 p.m., Stevie's mother, ready for work, wasn't overly concerned, but was somewhat annoyed by Stevie's absence. His stepfather, Terry, suggested they drive around the neighborhood to locate Stevie. Pam agreed, and together they briefly searched for Stevie, but with no sign of the boy, Terry dropped Pam off for work as planned. Returning home with hopes that Stevie would already be there. Unfortunately, he wasn't. Terrified, Pam and Terry, along with Michael's mother, Dana, reported their boys missing at 9 p.m. In another part of the neighborhood at 3.30 p.m. on the same day, eight-year-old Christopher Byers, a friend of Stevie and Michael, was gliding down his street on a skateboard, utilizing his stomach on the board instead of his feet, ignoring all admonishments from Mark, his adoptive father. 
Mark repeatedly warned Chris about the dangers of riding this way, and as fate would have it, Mark arrived home before Chris could change into a standing position. Upset, Mark forcefully pulled Chris into the house by his arm and administered a severe whipping, such that there was an imprint of Mark's belt on Chris's body. Following Mark's punishment, Chris was instructed to sweep the carport. Mark subsequently explained to Chris's mother what occurred and soon left the home to collect Melissa's older son, Ryan Clark, from a court appearance. Unbeknownst to Mark and Melissa, Chris left his home, abandoning his chores. Chris soon arrived at Bobby Posey's house, a neighborhood friend, around 3.45 p.m., and confided in Bobby that he desired to escape Mark's frequent whippings by running away. Chris asked Bobby to accompany him, but Bobby declined, and at 5.30 p.m., Mark returned home with Ryan. Upon arrival, he discovered Chris was gone and hadn't completed his chores. Melissa believed Chris was outside, but he was gone. Deeply concerned, Mark and Melissa reported Chris as missing at 8 p.m. The boys were last accounted for around 6 p.m. when they visited Carlos Seals, their friend. Carlos encountered all three boys together, not far from Robin Hood Hills. Carlos observed Stevie and Michael on their bikes while Christopher was on foot, occasionally riding the rear wheel pegs of Stevie's or Michael's bike. The boys engaged in a brief conversation with Carlos, explaining their intention to find a campsite for the night, as they had planned to run away from their homes. Carlos stated the boys had sleeping bags, but none were ever discovered. Nevertheless, this encounter marks the point where the boys' trail went cold as they departed Carlos, heading down North 14th Street. Dreadfully, Stevie, Michael and Christopher ventured into the woods near Robin Hood Hills, an area also known as the Devil's Den. Their innocent adventure took a sinister turn when they crossed paths with an unknown assailant. Whether through deceit or force, the boys were taken away from the safety of their neighborhood to a secluded location deep within the woods. And within the shadows of those trees, a scene of unimaginable horror and violence plagued the area. The boys suffered through brutal beatings and endured injuries akin to severe torture. Investigators would later be haunted by what they saw that dreadful day. As time moved along and the sun drew nearer to its final destination, the violence escalated and the perpetrator would place two of the boys inside a creek while they were still breathing. One of the boys, young Christopher, would be castrated and mutilated. Their lifeless bodies were discovered submerged in a muddy creek, hogtied and severely injured, a grim testament to the brutality that had unfolded. After their lives were taken, in an attempt to hide evidence, the assailant discarded the young victim's clothing inside the creek as well, pushing it down with sticks to conceal the atrocity that transpired. According to forensic experts, the crime occurred between 5.30 p.m. and 9 p.m. The next day, May 6th at 1.45 p.m., a policeman spotted a shoe floating down the creek. As he leaned in to collect it, he slipped, fell, and landed atop one of the boys, revealing the tragic truth of what had occurred the day previous. The grim details of their deaths would forever remain etched in the memories of all those who saw, heard, and spoke of the crime. This tale of abduction, violence, and murder sent shockwaves through the tight-knit community of West Memphis, forever altering the lives of those with hearts. As media gathered, the mystery surrounding the identity of the perpetrator would linger, fester, and subsequently boil over, as the community mounted immense pressure on investigators to uncover the monster in their community. Two days after the crime, police began rounding up the usual suspects, Enter Damien Eccles, 18, who would find himself under suspicion for the crime. Damien had been recently released from a psychiatric hospital in Little Rock, Arkansas, where he received treatment for major depression. He was sent there after two incidents at a detention center, one where he sucked blood from the wound of another detainee, and the second in which he threatened to kill his father. He was known to Arkansas officials to practice witchcraft, Satanism, and ritualistic cult activities. Damien was questioned by Steve Jones, a juvenile officer, and Lieutenant Sudbury about the murders, but no notes were initially taken. Subsequently, 
police brought in Jesse Miss Skelly, 17, a neurodiverse individual with an IQ of 72 and a friend of Demian Eccles. Jesse was interviewed on June 3rd, 1993. Detectives told Jesse there was a $30,000 reward for information leading to convictions in the case. Feeling intrigued by the idea of receiving such a large amount of money, Jesse agreed to be interviewed, but he didn't know it would last 12 hours. Jesse was administered a polygraph test during this time, where he denied participating in the crime and rebuffed the notion that he engaged in satanic rituals. Detective Durham detected deception, and after hours of complex, aggressive, harsh, and coercive questioning by investigators Gitchell and Ridge, Jesse began to tell the officers what they wanted to hear. Jesse confessed, but was he guilty? Jesse minimized his involvement in the crime when speaking to police, instead implicating his two buddies, Damien Eccles, 18, and Jason Baldwin, 16. Jesse confessed that he was present during the crime and therefore an eyewitness. He admitted to preventing Michael Moore from escaping while his friends engaged in the actual crimes, perhaps with reward money in mind, Jesse placed himself a little too close to the crime to qualify as a mere witness. The only problem was, officers were troubled by the inconsistencies in Jesse's statements. At first, he said the crime had occurred at noon and later he'd recant to say it occurred at night. Furthermore, his confession simply didn't match the crime scene as we've seen in other cases. Jesse stated rope was used, but actually it was the boy's own shoelaces that restrained them. Jesse provided inconsistent information about the events leading up to and following the crime. His accounts of how the murders occurred conflicted, and he offered differing descriptions of who carried out certain aspects of the crime and when those actions took place. Investigators questioned Jesse utilizing a local newspaper with pictures of the boys, allowing him to see what they looked like instead of ensuring he could recall on his own. Detectives pointed at each boy, asking Jesse to describe what happened to each. Many of his assertions did not match the physical evidence found at the crime scene, including the cause of death and the condition of the victim's bodies. Approximately five hours in, police begin taping Jesse's confession, and of the 12-hour interrogation, only 46 minutes were actually recorded, which happens to be when Jesse confessed. Coincidentally, when Jesse's account didn't match the facts of the crime, investigators stopped the tape and, when it restarted, Jesse's confession suddenly changed to fit the scene more harmoniously. In addition, investigators appeared to ask leading questions that not only had the necessary answer embedded in the question, but they also allowed Jesse to passively agree by saying, yeah. Leading questions also provide Jesse with hints of what investigators wanted to hear, allowing him to riff off of their questions as an improv artist does. You told me he had good West Memphis, so him and Damien went, then I went with him. All right, when? Wednesday. All right, when did you go with him? <laughs> that morning. At nine o'clock in the morning? Yes, it is. Okay. I went with them, you know. Now, were you in a car? Whose car were you on? We walked. Y'all walked? Okay. Right, we walked, and then, uh. Where did you go? We went to Robin Hood. You went to the Robin Hood. Explain to me where those woods are. Not, uh, Blue Bacon, so Just a little patch of woods. A little patch of woods. Behind Blue Bacon? Behind it. Right back there, behind it. Okay. What occurred while you were there? When I was there, I saw Damien hit this one. He hit this one boy real bad, and then, uh, now he started and stuff, and then, uh... Alright, you've got in front of you a picture that was taken out of the newspaper, I believe. It's got three boys, and these are the three boys that were on that day in Robin Hood Woods. Okay, which one of those three boys is it you say Damien hit? The third picture, which will be this boy right here. Yeah. All right, that's uh, the buyer's boy. Christopher. That's who you're pointing at. Mm -hmm. If you read the caption, the grizzly slain from left, eight-year-old Michael Moore, Stephen Branch, and Christopher Byers. 
Okay. So you saw Damien strike Chris Byers in the head. What did he hit him with? He hit him with his fist and bruised him all up real bad. And then uh, Jason turned around and hit Steve Branch. Okay. And started doing the same thing. Then the other one took off. Michael uh, Moore took off running. So I chased him and grabbed him and held him to they got there and then I left. And does he going back towards where the houses he, he are? Is he going to Blue Beacon? Is he going out towards the field? He Where's he to, running to? Towards the houses. Towards the houses. Where the pipe is that goes across the water. Yeah. Okay. He ran out there and I, and I called him and brought him back and then I took off. Okay. Well you came back a little bit later. And all three boys are tied. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And I took off and went home. All right. Have they got their clothes on when you saw them tied? They had them off. They had already gotten them off. When he first hit the boy, when Damien first hit the first boy, did they have their clothes on then? Mm -hmm. All right. When did they take their clothes off? Right, right after they beat up all three of them and beat them up real bad. Beat them up real bad. And then they took their clothes off. Then, I, then they tied them. Then they tied them up, tied their hands up. They start and stuff, cutting them and stuff. And I saw it and I turned around and looked. And then I took off running. I went home. And then they called me and asked me how come I didn't stay. I told them I just couldn't. Just couldn't stay for them. I couldn't stay and see. What they were doing to him. You saw somebody with a knife. Who had a knife? Jason. Jason had a knife. What did he cut with the knife? What did you see him cut, or who did you see him cut? I saw him cut one of the little boys. All right, where did he cut him at? He was cutting him in the face. Cutting him in the face. All right. Another boy was cut, I understand. Where was he cut at? At the bottom. On his bottom? Was he face down, and he was... Or he was, he, you talking about bottom? Do you mean right here? Mm -hmm. In his okay. So oh, right. you know what his is? Yeah, that's where he was cut at. That's where he was cut. Which boy was that? Right there. Look, you're talking about the buyer's boy mm -hmm. again? Okay. Are you sure that he was the one that was? That's when I seen him. No. You went home. And about what time was it? that all this was taking place? They called me about... I'm not saying when they called you. I'm saying what time was it that you were actually there in the park? I was there about 12. About noon? Okay. Was it after school? I let out? Well, these other boys... They skipped school. They skipped school. They was going to catch their bus or stuff, and they was on their bikes. So, all right. Hey, did you say the boys skipped school that day? These little boys did. Are you? They was going to catch their, going somewhere, and like I said, David, Damien, and them left before I did. I told them I made them there and stuff. I had to get ready and stuff. I made them there. And it was early in the morning, so. They went ahead and met, met me up. Uh, they went ahead and went up there, and then I came up, you know, later on behind them. What time did you get there? I got there about nine. In the morning? Mm hmm Of Wednesday morning? Mm hmm <clears throat> And when, what time is it right now? Right now? Yeah. You don't know what time it is? Do you not wear a watch? It's at home. So, my dad, my dad woke me up this morning. your time period might not be exactly right what you're saying. Right. But it, it was like early in the day, but you don't know exactly what time. Okay. Because we got, I've got some real confusion with the times you're telling me. But now, this nine o'clock in the evening call that you've got. Explain that to me. Well, after all the stuff happened that night that they'd done it. Okay. I went home about noon, then they called me. Nine o'clock at, at night, they come to me. Okay. And what did they tell you on the telephone? They asked me how come I left so early and stuff. 
something. I told him I couldn't stand there watching it no more, so I had to do something get out of there. Okay. <laughs> Who called you? Jason. And you mentioned you heard some voice in the background? I heard some thing. And what else? I think you said that he made the call from his house? He made a call from his house. And Damien was hollering in the background and said, we done it, we done it. What we're going to do if somebody saw us, what we're going to do. Okay. Now, the knives. Was there one knife, two knives? Was your knife there? Did somebody take you and use your knife? Do you have a knife? Where is it at? Okay. The knife that you said Jason was using, where is it? I don't, I don't know what he done with it, because after I left, then that's when I don't know what they done with it. After I left, I don't know what they done with it. He didn't tell you he hit it somewhere. Hit it somewhere. Well, I, I got a feeling here. You're not quite telling me everything. Now, we're, you know, we are recording everything. So this is very, very important to tell us the entire truth. If you were there the whole time, then tell us you were there the whole time. Don't leave anything out. This is very, very important. Now, just tell us the truth. I was there until they tied them up. And then that's when I left. After they tied them up, I left. But you saw them cutting on the boys. I saw them cutting on them. So what, what else left is there? They laid, they laid the knife down beside them. And I saw them tying them up. And then that's when I left. Were the boys conscious or were they? They was unconscious. Then. Unconscious. Okay. And after I left, they done more. They done more. So they had them under control. You were there the whole time that was taking place? That was there. Okay. One of them was cut on the face real bad. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. And one of them was being cut on his face. Yes, did you ever use, did anyone use a stick and hit the boys with? I mean, I had kind of a big old stick when he hit that first one. After he hit him with the spears, knocked him down, then he got a big old stick and hit him. What did the stick look like? I mean, was it like a a, a, a big log like that, or is it, or is it a stick? It, I'll say it was about that, about that big round. <clears throat> I'll say about that now. Okay. About the size of a baseball bat, and maybe just a little bit bigger around. Yeah. That's, 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 that's what you described as your hands, right? No. Okay. How long was the knife that Jason was using? All right. You're describing a knife that would be about six inches long. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And what kind of blade did it have on it? Uh, like a regular. Just regular knife blade. Was it a knife that you fold up, or was it a like a hunting knife that's just, just one piece? Just you fold up knife. It was a folding knife. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, does Damien have a knife? No. He doesn't have one. He didn't have one that night. He didn't have one that night. Did he borrow yours? I didn't borrow mine. Okay. Did they have a briefcase with them? Mm -hmm. Didn't, you didn't see a briefcase? I didn't case. see a briefcase. Not unless they left it there that, that day before it happened. Not unless they left it there then, but I didn't see it there that day. Have you ever seen them with a briefcase before? I seen them. Once that one night, I seen them with them that night. Okay. What, what is kept inside that briefcase? They had some cocaine and a little gun. Is that where you first saw the pictures mm -hmm. of the boys? I think that's and you saw the pictures in the briefcase? Mm -hmm. I've heard when we had that cult. Okay. Now, you have participated in this cult, right? Yes. How long have you been involved in it? been in about three months. Okay. Now, on these, these meetings, have they ever been violent? Anybody got mad and gotten fight? No. Okay. How long after you got home before you received the phone call? 30 minutes? An hour? Um, an hour after you got home? Okay. So they were there for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. When he called you on the phone, did he say you just got in? Um, he, 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 he called me when he first got out the comment. He said, I 
I come out, I come out later. I come out, I couldn't stand, I had this of males. Okay. You, they, you couldn't stand it. And then Damien, I heard Damien in the background saying, we done it, we done it, what we gonna do now? What about somebody saw us? When you got with the, with the boys, and with Jason and Baldwin, when you three were in the woods, and then the little boys come up, about what time was it when the boys came up to the woods? I say it was about five, 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 six. Now, did you have your watch on at the time? You didn't have your watch on. Um, like you told me earlier, around seven or eight or well, which time is it? based on Jesse's confession in the spring of 1994. They were apprehended following an investigation that pursued the teens with blinders on, never considering any other plausible options, including a man that entered a Bojangles restaurant near the crime scene both wet and blooded. While some believe Terry Hobbs, young Stevie's stepfather, is a suitable candidate for the crime. Nonetheless, this moment marked a significant turning point in West Memphis history, as the three became the center of a high-profile legal case that would captivate public attention for decades. Miss Kelly faced a separate trial, while Eccles and Baldwin were jointly tried in 1994. This separation was necessitated by the Bruton Rule, which prevented the admission of Miss Kelly's confession as evidence against his co-defendants. However, Miss Kelly's confession was published in the local newspaper, causing its contents to permeate the small town prior to the trials, tainting the entire jury pool towards an extreme level of bias. Even though a change of venue was ordered by the court, the pre-trial publicity had a long reach in rural Arkansas. Jesse Miss Kelly was tried on January 26th of 1994. During the trial, Richard Offshee, an expert on false confessions and police coercion, testified that the brief recording of Miss Kelly's interrogation was a classic example of police coercion, pointing out the many respects in which Miss Kelly's confessions were inconsistent with each other, as well as contradictory to the crime scene. For example, Miss Kelly admitted to watching Damien commit indecent acts with the children. However, there was no forensic evidence indicating such activities occurred. Even still, disregarding the inconsistencies of his statements on February 5th, 1994, Miss Kelly was convicted by a jury of his peers on one count of first-degree murder and two counts of second-degree murder. The court immediately sentenced him to a life sentence plus 40 years in prison. 
His conviction was appealed, but the Arkansas Supreme Court initially affirmed the conviction. Three weeks later, Eccles and Baldwin faced trial, accused of satanic murders. The satanic panic of the 1990s Bible Belt was in full swing, to such an extent that some found it reminiscent of the Salem Witch Trials. To support their case, the prosecution brought in Dale W. Griffiths, an occult expert from an unaccredited university, who testified that the murders were part of a satanic ritual. Eccles himself contested Detective Ridge's recollection of their earlier conversation, even accusing Ridge of dishonesty in some claims. The defense objected when the prosecution delved into Eccles' violent past, but their objections were overruled. The defense suggested that Eccles' knowledge was derived from his common sense intuitions and common knowledge from within the community. However, the prosecution argued that his knowledge was too precise to be solely from public sources, citing details like drowning and the extent of mutilation. And on March 19, 1994, the verdict was delivered and both Eccles and Baldwin were adjudicated as guilty. Eccles received the death penalty while Baldwin was sentenced to life in prison, both found guilty of three counts of murder. As the years passed, the West Memphis Three's path to freedom began with a series of appeals that ultimately led to their release from prison. In their latter appeals, Dan Stidham alleged there was improper interference during jury deliberations. Stidham argued that an error occurred when the judge interrupted the jury by opening the door during deliberations to inquire about the need for lunch. According to Stidham, the jury foreman informed Judge Burnett that they were nearing the end of their deliberations. In response, Judge Burnett remarked, you'll require sustenance when you return for the sentencing phase. Stidham further noted that the foreman inquired about the outcome if Miss Kelly were found not guilty, but Judge Burnett left that question unanswered as he closed the door. With such improper actions, supported by DNA evidence that matched other individuals, their legal team, and the tireless efforts of advocacy groups sparked a reconsideration of their convictions. Thus, growing doubts surrounding the case and advancements in forensic science played pivotal roles in their appeals. These resulting legal battles, marked by intense scrutiny and public interest, gradually eroded their convictions ultimately leading to their release in August of 2011, bringing an end to their long and arduous journey through the criminal justice system after serving 18 years in prison. The men, now in their 30s, were freed under an Alford plea. This kind of plea allowed them to maintain their innocence while simultaneously pleading guilty. They were given time served, plus a suspended 10-year sentence, meaning if they violated their parole, they would be returned to prison. An Alford plea is a legal maneuver where the state holds all the cards, essentially taking hostage the freedom of the wrongfully convicted. And if their freedom is to be regained, abiding by all the state's demands is required, which is why the West Memphis Three finally plead guilty. This plea allowed the state to consider the case closed and the matter adjudicated. It also barred the men from suing or attempting to recover monetary damages for their wrongful imprisonment in perpetuity. Only upon agreement to these demands were the men freed from their wrongful convictions. The state has officially closed the case while the true perpetrator remains at large. The Alford plea raises the fundamental question. Is our justice system more concerned with someone paying the price for a crime regardless of whether they're actually guilty? Please let us know below in the comments. Even though there are varying theories as to who's the real perpetrator, the question is, what is justice? Though justice can't and won't be had in this case, the pursuit of justice is rooted in the finding of fact and truth. It is to maintain balance and make right those things that are wrong, to return what is lost and to repair what is broken. Though multiple theories abound, most agree that the lack of evidence presented during the trials was insufficient to attain guilty verdicts and thus were unjust decisions based in bias. Therefore, the subsequent release of those that have been confined due to unjust verdicts 
even though not exonerated, indeed does not provide balance, but at least tips the scales in the right direction, which is the principle for which the American justice system is built. As incredibly imperfect as it is, at least the West Memphis Three are free. Thanks for watching. Share this video with a friend. Please like, subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified of brand new videos.